Just like in the rest of the ancient world, slavery was a common practice in Arabia centuries before the coming of Islam. Sources tell about slaves being brought to Arabia from the Middle East, India and other countries. But the biggest source of slaves in pre-Islamic Arabia were African slaves from present-day Ethiopia, Eritrea, Mozambique, Kenya and so on. Old Arabic poetry tells about dark-skinned foreign slaves called Habash. Slavery persisted after Islam became the law of the land in Arabia, and expanded with the territorial advance of the Caliphate as well. How did slavery in Arabia transform following the ascent of Islam? What kind of work were the slaves forced to do in the territory of the Caliphate? In this episode, Kings and Generals is going to talk about slavery in the Caliphate. Medieval soldiers were enticed with promises of war spoils, life-changing treasures that may or may not actually materialize, which they may or may not live to spend. It's risk-reward, and we've got an experience that captures this idea with our sponsor Expedition Agatha. It's a blend of first-person medieval combat focused on melee action and looter games, where you progress through better and better gear. The catch here is that while powerful gear is worth striving for, you can lose it again if something goes wrong. That's the high risk, the high reward being that you'll need advanced gear to survive the grueling PvP and PvE encounters that await on the lost continent of Mu. This mysterious land is full of occult treasures, mythical vistas, and of course piles of danger, adventure, and secrets. You can play co-op in parties of three, or head out solo to fight across this strange land with visceral, brutal combat and tons of weapons and styles to try. On each expedition, you're either a mercenary who risks losing their equipment but enjoys character progression, or a freebooter where you can't progress your quests or skills but gear is freely given and lost without risk. Pick carefully as you plan your next adventure. The game just launched into early access, and you can check it out on Steam or via our link in the description. Slavery in Arabia goes back to the pre-Islamic Jahiliya ignorance period. Arabia had several sources of slave supply, and the largest among them were conflicts. Arabs would raid bordering Byzantine and Persian provinces for the purposes of getting war booty and slaves and the Ajami, Iraqi slaves, were prominent among them. Inter-tribal conflict within Arabia would result in the victorious side taking the surviving members of the losing tribe as prisoners, but most of them were ransomed before they could be turned into slaves. But the majority of slaves were imported from Africa. Mecca was a major trading center of the region at the time, and trade caravans, including those which transported African slaves, were going through Mecca. Arab slave owners would purchase them in Mecca. Also, raiding parties would attack caravans and capture slaves for themselves or sell them later. There were two types of slaves, purchased ones and slaves born in the house of their master. Arabia's climate and terrain limited the scope of work in which slaves could be used, but they would work as servants of rich Arabs, as shepherds and as caravan guides. Female slaves would also be used for sexual purposes. In theory, Islam saw a natural state of a human being as being free, stated as al asahuwa il hurriya Islam brought some limitations and regulations to slavery in Arabia, but slavery was such an ordinary phenomenon for that age, along with being a fundamental element of Arab society, that it was not possible to outright prohibit slavery. All of the Arab elite, including the Prophet, owned slaves. But at the same time, there are numerous Quranic verses and hadiths describing the emancipation of slaves by the Prophet Muhammad, such as Bilal, who became the first Muezzin, caller for prayer in the history of Islam, and Zayd, Muhammad's stepson. During his farewell sermon, Muhammad said, An Arab has no superiority over a non-Arab, nor a non-Arab has any superiority over an Arab. Also, a white has no superiority over black nor a black has any superiority over white, except by piety and good action. Historians Neusner and Son argue that prohibiting slavery in the context of 7th century Arabia apparently would have been as useful as prohibiting poverty. It would have reflected a noble ideal, but would have been unworkable on an immediate basis without establishing an entirely new socio-economic system. And its recommendation that slaves be freed is on the same plane as its recommendation that the poor be clothed and the hungry be fed. 
Thus, slavery was not prohibited in Islam. But the ascension of the Islamic Caliphate led to some reforms in terms of treatment of slaves, their release, and amended procedures related to enslavement. The Quran stated that a slave Muslim is better than a free pagan, that it was better to marry a slave Muslim female than a free pagan. Islam barred Muslims from enslaving other Muslims, called for humane and kind treatment of slaves, and prohibited killing them. The Abbasid Caliph al mutasim freed 8,000 of his slaves on his deathbed as manumission was encouraged by Islam. A child born to a freeman father and a slave mother was considered free. This slave woman could not be sold off anymore and would be set free upon the death of the master. The state prohibited freemen from selling their children into slavery as a punishment for debt or a crime. Despite this, the slave population increased due to purchase through military campaigns, commercial purchase, procreation of slaves, and interstate agreements, where the caliphate insisted on payment of tribute through the import of slaves. People of the book, Jews and Christians, were safe from being enslaved, but Muslims could purchase Jewish and Christian slaves, in case they had become slaves before their purchase, but it was allowed to turn pagans into slaves, even if they would decide to convert to Islam. Moreover, there was a distinction in terms of enslavement between Dar al-Islam, the realm of Islam, and Dal al-Hab, the realm of war. Dar al-Islam was the territory where Islam was prevalent, and therefore the laws of peacetime applied, while Dar al-Hab was the territory dominated by non-believers, who did not recognize Allah and Muhammad as his prophet, therefore a peacetime law did not apply there. This loophole was used to import slaves who were already Muslims, or for the castration of slaves, a practice which was prohibited by Islam. Although good treatment of slaves was encouraged by Islam, slaves were essentially rightless. Their testimonies were not admitted at judicial proceedings, offence against slaves required half of the punishment envisaged for the same offence against freemen, slaves were not allowed to enter into a contract, and so on. The death rate of slaves was quite high, particularly among those employed for plantation and mining slavery. On the other hand, the vast majority of slaves lived under better conditions than, for instance, their counterparts in ancient Greece and Rome. Masters were obliged to provide slaves with medical attention, shelter, and support in old age, and were prohibited from overworking them. They could be forced by Islamic courts to emancipate a slave whom they had mistreated, in some cases, slaves had a contractual right to buy their freedom over time, or be emancipated upon the master's death. The expansion of the caliphate and its military successes were the primary sources of slave supply. People of different races and beliefs, such as Assyrians, Copts, Persians, Nubians, Berbers, Indians, Greeks, Turks, Slavs, etc., were enslaved by the caliphate. Slaves were acquired from all over the Middle East, Egypt, Iran, the Caucasus, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Central Asia, India, Spain, Central and Eastern Europe, even China and Southeast Asia. A significant part of the slave supply of Arabia, even before Islam, was from Africa, with countries like Ethiopia and Nubia being the most prominent in this regard. This continued after the ascension of Islam too and historian Yosef ben Yukanan argues that jihads were brought to Africa as early as the year 640 AD. The expansion of the Caliphate into Egypt and Sub-Saharan Africa, into what the Arabs called Balad ul Sudan, the land of the blacks, enabled a higher supply of African slaves into the empire. This supply was both from military conquest and booty, along with treaties signed with African states, where they agreed to supply the Caliphate with slaves annually. Moreover, Arabs set up slave trading posts along the southeastern coast of the Indian Ocean, including the archipelago of Zanzibar. This paved the way for the major African slave trade to the Caliphate. Black African slaves were sold in slave markets in Egypt, South Arabia, and the Maghreb. Historian Paul Lovejoy estimates that close to 10 million Africans were shipped out as slaves to Arabia and the Caliphate. According to him, every year 5,000 Africans were brought to Arabia as slaves between the years 650 and 1600. Luis Felipe Jalen Castro argues that 8 million African people were sold or sent into slavery through the Oriental and Trans-Saharan slavery routes between the 8th and 19th centuries, 
Historians might disagree on the numbers, going as high as 30 million. But the truth is that millions of Africans were forced to live and work as slaves in the Caliphate. The slave trade from Africa to Arab countries continued right until the beginning of the 20th century. For instance, slavery in Saudi Arabia was formally abolished as late as 1962, in Oman in 1970. Africa had become a pragmatic choice for slave supply of the Caliphate, as towards the 8th century, most of the borders of the Arab Caliphate had already become more or less stable. There were fewer expansionist wars, which meant there were fewer slaves imported. By then, the Eastern Roman Empire and the Frankish Kingdom, bordering the Iberian possessions of the Caliphate, had become strong enough to oppose further expansion of the Caliphate. Moreover, they were people of the book, and enslavement of Christians was a legally problematic matter. For instance, in the 9th century, the Egyptian Christians rebelled against the Caliphate, and following their defeat, many of them were sold as slaves in Damascus. According to the historian Adam Metz, this was widely criticized in the Caliphate and was considered absolutely illegal. In contrast, Sub-Saharan Africa did not have a political entity strong enough to oppose the Caliphate, and it had maintained and enhanced its position as one of the major sources of slave supply for the Caliphate. Unlike the slaves in the Americas, where they were mostly forced to work in manual labor jobs, such as working on plantations and mining, in the Caliphate, slaves were used in a wider scope of jobs. In the Americas, slaves were a major tool of production, while in the Caliphate they were mostly used in service jobs or for military purposes. Slaves worked as servants, nurses, concubines, entertainers, eunuchs, business assistants, craftsmen, builders and soldiers. There were also types of slave jobs which existed in the Jahiliya period but were prohibited by Islam, such as masters forcing female slaves into prostitution for their personal material gain. Some of the jobs, particularly being a soldier or taking part in administration and business, allowed for upward social mobility for slaves, and Mamluk slaves are the perfect example of the former. In general, slaves working in domestic and urban settings were not subject to overworking and cruelty, and the problem with the Arab historiography of that period is that it's very much focused on urban Arabia, not only with regard to the issue of slavery, but in general. Slaves working in rural settings are largely overlooked, despite being subject to the hardest living conditions among the slaves of Arabia. They were mostly employed in agriculture, mining, and the drainage of marshes. These were mostly black slaves, who were more prone to being overworked, being subject to cruelty, and living in worse conditions, often crammed in dozens in small spaces. It is said that no slave lived for longer than five years in the Saharan salt mines. Extremely hard living and working conditions existed in cotton and sugar fields. The slave labor of the black slaves, Zanj as the Arabs called them, in the marshlands and salt flats of southern Iraq, are among the most vivid examples of cruelty against slaves in the Caliphate. But white slaves were brought to the Caliphate as well, and were mostly employed in the military, as business associates and for entertainment of the Arab elite. This demonstrated the existence of racial discrimination in the Caliphate, despite the fact that Islam considered all human beings equal regardless of the color of their skin. Most of the white slaves were Slavic and Turkic, Slavs were considered more expensive than Turks, and were brought into the Caliphate through Germany to Spain. Prague was also one of the centers of the slave trade from Europe to the Caliphate. Meanwhile, Turkic slaves were mostly sold in the slave market of Samarkand. A good-looking white slave woman would cost 1,000 dinars. In some cases, this cost would go as high as 10,000 dinars. In contrast, a good-looking black slave woman would cost 150 to 300 dinars. Black male slaves would cost even less, their purchase was around 25 to 30 dinars. A special category of slaves in the Caliphate were those specialized in arts and entertainment, who were educated by their masters and then sold to the Arab elite for massive sums. One to two thousand dinars was the average cost of an entertainer. In 937, the de facto ruler of the Caliphate, Ibn Raik, purchased a popular female singer for 14,000 dinars. While Islam alleviated the suffering of slaves and placed certain restrictions on their abuse and encouraged good treatment of slaves, 
their lives were extremely hard. Slaves working in agriculture, mining and construction had a shorter lifespan and were more susceptible to ill treatment. One of the sites of cruel and inhumane treatment of slaves was the Basra marshlands in southern Iraq, where black slaves were forced to work under horrible conditions. They rebelled against the Caliphate in 869 and would trouble the state for more than two decades. In our upcoming episode, we're going to talk about the Zanj Rebellion, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.